Live from KSAT 12, The Night Beat starts right now. Smart, talented, reliable, and extremely loving. Those are the words to describe the latest Uvalde shooting victim who was laid to rest today. The family and friends of 10-year-old Alethea Ramirez said their final goodbyes today. According to her obituary, she dreamed of one day attending an art school in Paris, but those dreams and so many more came to an end 13 days ago after a gunman stole her life and the lives of 20 others. Funeral services for the Uvalde victims continue this week. Tomorrow will be for nine-year-old Ellie Garcia at Sacred Heart Catholic Church. This week, Uvalde School Massacre survivor Maya Serio will be one of the many people testifying before Congress on gun violence. The hearing is scheduled for this Wednesday. KSAT will have a crew there covering the story. The hearing will also include victims from the Buffalo supermarket shooting that happened 10 days before the Uvalde shooting. Meanwhile, back here in San Antonio tonight, a benefit concert aimed at helping the families of victims killed in the Uvalde shooting just wrapped up. Country artists and fans came from near and far with one goal in mind, doing the most good. The night team's Lee Waldman reports. The wristbands are prepped. Beers are cold. Sound check is good. Everything's set in place for the I Heart Uvalde benefit concert at Cowboys Dance Hall. Once we heard about what had happened in Uvalde, we knew we needed to, uh, to, to act fast and uh, do our best to help out the, the families that were affected by the horrible tragedy. Alec Halverson and the rest of I Heart Media started making calls and texting artists like Russell Dickerson, Kevin Fowler, and Easton Corbin to perform at tonight's concert. Singer Clay Hollis didn't hesitate, heading here right after his show in Corpus Christi last night. I, I love the shirts that we have today, Uvalde Strong. So so that's, uh, you know, uh, really neat to see. And uh, I think there's uh, going to be a lot of happy people to, to contribute to a great cause. It's about more than the music for everyone inside of the dance hall. Sir, can you empty your pockets for me real quick? Especially Gwen Jo Bear and her husband. I'm out here to, you know, support the people of Uvalde. Um, in 99, I lost five friends at Columbine. She knows better than most. The pain the families and community are feeling is going to last which is why it's vital to keep helping for the months and years that follow. We didn't take advantage of the counseling services six months out, a year out, because that's not where we were at. And two years out when we tried to, a lot of the support and the funds had dried up and were gone. And so um, just really trying to support them the way that people supported us. That's why the sky's the limit with tonight's concert. A $25,000 donation came in for the love of kids and Harley's foundation before the show even started. It's something that really affected us deeply and it's something that we were just trying to help and be supportive and, and be a part of you know the, the big community that's really trying to love on and, and help everybody find some kind of peace in this terrible situation. Tonight over one hundred thirty eight thousand dollars was raised an astronomical amount. All of that money will go directly to the first state bank of Uvalde which is then given to the families of those victims. Live at Cowboys Dance Hall, Lee Waldman, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Lee. Now to an update on a story we first brought you on Friday. The barbecue benefit in Uvalde raised more than $10,000. The Mission House Foundation traded donations for brisket and sausage plates. According to the foundation, they sold out in less than two hours, selling more than 700 pounds of brisket. The money will go towards the Robb Elementary Memorial Fund. Well, if you're outside, you felt it. We hit record temperatures today, clocking in at 102, and the rest of the week should be a lot of the same. With fun summer plans now in full swing, it's time to remember that the heat isn't just uncomfortable, it can be dangerous. Camilla Juarez explains the signs of heat exhaustion and how parents can keep their families cool. Parents know taking the kids outdoors guarantees a speedy bedtime in the summer months. The sun's out, it's hot, and I'm trying to catch a tan. And you know, just have fun with my kids. Hassan Zia drove his family from Dallas to spend the weekend at SeaWorld. But after a couple hours in the South Texas heat, it proved to be unbearable for them. We did not go to the water park. We only went to the other side of SeaWorld. So we saw the orca show and all of that. Um, but, uh, but yeah. How was that? It was very, very hot. Too much sun can lead to heat exhaustion, which means your body doesn't have enough water to keep your body cool. Something Yvrea Cruz tries to avoid for her and her kids. Normally parents don't come um, between certain times because 
it gets really hot, so either in the morning or when the sun starts going down. According to the Center for Disease Control, there are signs when heat exhaustion is coming on. They say to keep an eye out for headaches, dizziness, nausea, and a rise in body temperature. And if you notice the symptoms, call for medical care. This is the perfect way to kill the heat. While waiting for help, put that person in the shade, remove any extra clothing like socks or shoes, and wash their head and neck with cold water. Since many of the city pools don't open until next Saturday, many parents chose to beat the heat here at Hemisphere Park. This is perfect because I don't have to worry about the kids. Um, you know, I, they're, they're a little too young to be in the water or in the water park for too long. So this is safe for them. Now the city of San Antonio has opened cooling centers to prevent heat related illnesses and starting tomorrow an additional nine centers will open specifically for seniors. We have a list to all of those centers on our website. Gamaliel Juarez, KSAT 12 News. Hey, that breeze today really helped us out a bit and we'll have more wind in place over the next couple of afternoons. So that will help to provide a little bit of relief, but it is still going to be dangerously hot. And yeah, we're Texans and we're tough, but uh, it's going to be very hot out there. And in some cases, dangerously hot. If you don't take care of yourselves, we've got a heat advisory that will be in place from 1 to 8 p.m. tomorrow for the metro area and out toward the Rio Grande from Del Rio down to Eagle Pass up across the hill country and up to the Austin Metro. So a big portion of South Central Texas will be under a heat advisory tomorrow because of these temperatures. Air temperatures as high as about 105 along the I-35 corridor and as high as 110 degrees in some isolated spots uh, out west toward the Rio Grande west of the I-35 corridor. So it is going to be a scorcher tomorrow and the whole week is going to be pretty much just as hot. I've got a look at what you can expect in the week ahead, and I'll tell you why it's going to be so hot this week coming up in the full forecast. Tim. Katie, we'll see you again in just a bit. Taking a look at other stories we've been following today, people in a northeast side neighborhood reportedly heard several gunshots before discovering a woman was hit and killed by that gunfire. San Antonio police called to the area for a shooting just before 5 a.m. outside a home on Bloomdale, not far from Redman Road and Loop 410. When they arrived there, they found a woman who had been shot in the head. She was pronounced dead at the scene. The Bear County Medical Examiner's Office has still not identified her yet tonight. San Antonio police say a wrong way driver caused a chain reaction crash that claimed two lives that happened overnight on Highway 37. Police say the driver of a Ford Focus was going the wrong way when it smashed into a Toyota Corolla around 2.30 this morning. The Focus driver ended up in a grassy median and was pronounced dead at the scene. The Corolla driver collided into a tractor trailer before also ending up in the median. That driver also died at the scene. Both have yet to be identified. A Bear County deputy reportedly training their canine partner was uninjured after San Antonio police say someone was firing at them overnight. This incident happened around 11 o'clock last night at Rosedale Park. The deputy says he heard gunshots and then quickly realized someone was aiming at him. The deputy was able to call for help. SAPD Park Police did take someone who they found in the area into custody for questioning. Police also researched that area again in the morning for a weapon. No word on if they found anything. Tonight, the Kirby Police Department is investigating a crash that claimed the life of a driver today. It happened just before 3 p.m. on FM 78 near 1604 in Converse. When police first got there, they found a car engulfed in flames. Police say the driver hit a pole, causing the crash. The driver was dead at the scene, but has not been identified yet by the Bear County Medical Examiner's Office. Another deadly weekend in Philadelphia. Three people are dead and about a dozen hurt after gunfire erupted there. That shooting is just one of at least five across the country involving four or more victims in a violent 27 hour span. Three dead in Tennessee, three killed at a graduation party in Texas, and a 14 year old girl shot and killed in Phoenix. Here's ABC's Mona Kosar Abdi with the details. Terrifying moments unfold as a popular area filled with bars and restaurants in Philadelphia is rocked by gunfire. We got multiple victims. According to police, just after 11.30 p.m. Saturday night, officers patrolling South Street heard gunshots. Surveillance video capturing the chaos as a large crowd fled the area. Investigators are reviewing this video, which appears to show a fight between two men before the shooting erupted. These individuals eventually began firing at one another. 
with both being struck, one fatally. We also believe that the two other decedents, as well as a number of other shooting victims, were uninvolved in the initial altercation and were innocent bystanders. According to the Gun Violence Archive, there have been at least a dozen mass shootings this weekend alone. In Phoenix Saturday, eight people were shot and a 14-year-old girl killed after authorities say a fight in a strip mall escalated into a deadly shooting. And early Saturday in Chattanooga, 14 people were shot, three killed after authorities say several shooters opened fire at a nightclub. Once the shots fired, multiple people have seen the scene. That city's second mass shooting in the last week. I'm tired of standing in front of you talking about guns and bodies. Chattanooga will not tolerate this. Growing outrage over gun violence has many calling on lawmakers to, quote, do something. Bipartisan talks on gun legislation continue on Capitol Hill. Democratic Senator Chris Murphy telling CNN he's never been involved in negotiations as serious as these. We're not going to do everything I want. We are not going to put a piece of legislation on the table that's going to ban assault weapons. But right now, people in this country want us to make progress. Some of the leading legislative proposals on the table, incentives for states to put in place red flag laws, ways to strengthen background checks and funding for mental health and possibly school security. Monaco Sarabdi, ABC News, New York. Still to come on the night beat tonight, the memories left behind by Robb Elementary School teacher Ava Morellis will not be forgotten. What a friend wants people to know about who she was. Plus, this invasive species is known for lurking below the water and hitching a ride on boats. The problems they cause in how one area was able to eradicate zebra mussels from their lake. And two COVID subvariants are causing cases to rise. Data now showing those who are vaccinated and boosted could still catch it. This week, FDA advisors will be weighing the risks and benefits of the third COVID-19 vaccine option. Novavax is given as two doses three weeks apart. The company submitted a request for FDA authorization back in late January. Data from an FDA review released on Friday showed that Novavax is 90.4 percent effective overall against mild, moderate or severe COVID two and a half months after the second dose. On Tuesday, the FDA will vote on whether or not to recommend the vaccine. Meanwhile, two newer Omicron subvariants now make up about 7% of new COVID cases as of late May. That's according to the CDC. BA4 and BA5 were first discovered in South Africa and landed in the U.S. around late March. Health officials say these variants are gaining ground against the first Omicron subvariant BA2. CDC data shows the newer subvariants are more than four times as likely to escape antibodies in people who have been vaccinated and boosted compared to BA2. Coronaviruses historically do not give lasting immunity, and that's the reason why with the common cold coronaviruses, we can get infected maybe a couple times a year. The White House is expecting vaccination shots for kids under five to begin as soon as June 21st. However, they are still waiting for authorization and recommendations from the CDC and FDA. FDA advisors plan to meet again on that topic on June 15th. Taking a live look outside with live cam. It's 1015 and it's 87 yeah. degrees. I mean, but we could see. Uh, in one of those live shots there, that it was nice and breezy. Yes, out there. yes, very good point. I will say, uh, there, a warm breeze. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's kind of in some cases like a blow dryer. Yeah. Someone just yeah. blow dry in front of her face. That's um, great. We had more wind around today, and that certainly does help to provide a little bit of relief. It just keeps it from feeling at any point just too sticky and stagnant out there. And we'll also have more wind around for the next few days. So here is. Your weekly planner, it's got a whole lot of heat and a whole lot of sunshine in it. We've got high temperatures in the triple digits all week, even through next weekend. So we've got a heat wave on our hands and it did start today. We got up to 102 this afternoon at the airport in San Antonio. That's a new record high temperature for today's date, beating the old record of 101 from back in 1948. And that record high today is more than 10 degrees above average for this time of year. And that's something to keep in mind as well. Sure, we're getting into June. We expect it to be hot, but high temperatures this week, about 10 degrees above where they should be for this time of year. High temperatures elsewhere 
today. 100 the high in New Braunfels, 104 in Hondo, 107 in Del Rio. You would think, gosh, that's got to be close to a record, right? It was that tied your record for today's uh, your record high temperature for today's date. Del Rio didn't quite break it, but got pretty close elsewhere across Texas. Uh, it was really hot. Some additional cloud cover and some storms off to the northeast kept the Metroplex in the low 90s. Elsewhere, 100 Midland, 106 San Angelo, 104 Laredo and 103 in Abilene. So why is it so hot yet again? Well, the heat high is back. This is a ridge of high pressure and it's going to have a grip on our weather here over the next week or so. In fact, it starts to move a bit closer to us tomorrow. And what happens with these ridges of high pressure or heat highs is that when they're around, air sinks. Now when air rises, that's when we get showers and storms. We get the lift uh, to produce rain. But when the heat high is around, the opposite happens. The air sinks and that actually actually compresses the air and that allows it to heat up more easily. And that's why we see hotter days when the heat high is around and like what we're going to see this week above average temperatures while this ridge of high pressure hangs close to us. It'll be with us through the end of the week into next weekend. So the heat high is to blame for our above average temperatures here in the short term, but the weather pattern that brings us this heat high is due to the influence of La Nina over the entirety of North America. So when La Nina is in place, Generally speaking, the weather pattern over North America keeps the jet stream or these white arrows here dis displaced farther off to the north. We need them farther south to bring us those lows that bring rain, storms and cooler temperatures. But generally speaking with La Nina, that jet stream wants to hang off to the north and that keeps the cooler air and the better chances of rain displaced off to the north as well. So La Nina typically leaves the southern tier of the country, especially Texas and parts of the desert southwest, abnormally dry and hot. We've already been under the influence of La Nina since the winter, and we expect this to continue, unfortunately, all the way through the summer. At this hour, still 95 in Eagle Pass, 96 Del Rio, 87 Kerrville, and 82 in Gonzales. Down at Stinson, 87. It's 84 in Converse and 85 up in Bull Verde. Our dew points fell off a bit this afternoon, and they're still not too bad. We've got a few spots with dew points in the 50s, so it's not overly muggy, and we've still got a good breeze out of the southeast at about 10 to 15 miles per hour. As I mentioned, that breeze will be around again tomorrow, so if you've got kiddos heading out to day camps on Monday, I know we've got a lot of our kids kiddos out for summer if they're getting their uh, camp routine started early. Uh, send them with a lot of water and a lot of sunscreen. High temperature tomorrow 102. Steady breeze all day. That'll be nice but the UV index extreme. That means without any sunscreen tomorrow. Sunburn could start in as little as 10 minutes, so be sure to send them with the sunscreen as well. Here's how you start the day tomorrow. Low to mid 70s, very muggy with a few morning clouds and then abundant sunshine in the afternoon to heat us back up into the triple digits, but wind will be with us. Gusts up to 30 miles per hour at times tomorrow and also for the next couple of afternoons. So a little bit of a silver lining there. That's the best I can do. <laughs> we'll take it. It's a little bit of an offset. Back into the blast furnace <laughs> we go. All right, Greg Simmons will join us next with a preview of Instant Replay. Well, if you saw it just a few minutes ago on KSAT, the Golden State Warriors have evened up the NBA Finals after the Boston Celtics were able to steal Game 1 with more on instant replay. Let's check in with our Greg Simmons. I, I a real beat down today. I, I thought it would be kind of the opposite. I thought Golden State would win Game 1 and then Boston would bounce back in Game 2. Just switch yeah. the drama here. We have two state champions in high school softball, two headed to the state high school baseball tournament coming up tonight on a brand new edition of Instant Replay. Shots, he's 5 for 7 and for 3 and 2 for 9 from 2. Curry working against Horford, took his ankles. Not ready to give him back either. The Boston Celtics were able to steal game one of the NBA Finals in San Francisco, but not game two tonight. The turning point was the second half. Celtic turnovers led to Warrior points and the victory to even up this best of seven series at one win apiece as the Finals now head to Boston for games three and four. And now we know there will be a game five. <laughs> The O'Connor Panthers brought home the state softball tight end Class 6A after a walk-off walk last night. And earlier in the week, the DeHannis Cowgirls brought home the state trophy in Class 1A.
The Reagan Rattlers are headed to the state high school baseball tournament after outlasting Lake Travis in the best of three series. Who and when will they face first in the state 6A semifinals? We will tell you, and so are the DeHannis Cowboys. All that plus, why did the missions have to call off a number of their home games? The Spurs anniversary logos have not been accepted well by some Spurs fans. And do you believe the feud between Texas A&M head coach Jimbo Fisher and Alabama head coach Nick Saban is really over? Tonight, you decide. Instant replay is live, and it's after the night beat. I'll give you a hint. I don't think so. No. I, don't, I don't get the hint. No. no. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. We'll see you again in just a little bit. Still to come, a beloved teacher, a wife, and a mother. We hear from someone who knew about, uh, who, who knew her and about uh, all about her, and they're going to share their memories of Ava Morales. And zebra mussels might look innocent, but they cause massive damage to lakes across Texas. But one area has found a way to get rid of them all. In our latest Case Out Explains episode, we break down how and if the solution could be used here. of zebra mussels. It's an invasive species that once found in the water, it's nearly impossible to get rid of them. Yeah, they can cause some serious issues for boats and infrastructure, but a lake up in Waco did what seems impossible. They eradicated them. In this week's Case Out Explains, David Sears and Myra Arthur find out how and whether a solution like that could work for our local lakes here at home. There's just like fire ants or, you know, they just come and, and you really can't get rid of them. They just accumulate in these big clumps. You literally have millions, if not billions, of them out there. There's really nothing that can be done to eradicate them. There they are. There you go. Zebra mussels were found in Canyon Lake in 2017. A scuba diving type survey done at Canyon Lake, and they didn't find any adult zebra mussels, right? And 2017, was when it was infested. It happens fast and boats are to blame. The mussels attach themselves to boats and hang on to those that are not drained and dried. Essentially, they hitch a ride from lake to lake. 28 Texas lakes are considered infested with zebra mussels, which means they're there and reproducing. When they grow, they clog up pipes, they get all over boats. Um, they just basically destroy infrastructure. And that's a huge problem for places like Canyon Lake, where this is the community's water source. Look how the mussels clogged this water intake pipe belonging to Canyon Lake Water Service Company in 2019. The infestation choked off the water supply, dropping it by 50%. The fact is that they can smother things, anything that's in uh, the water. It's just spotting these. These are little Ironically, smothering is exactly the strategy that got rid of zebra mussels in Waco. Really didn't have much chance to succeed when we, when we did it but we thought, why not? The mussels were found in Lake Waco in 2014. They fell off of a barge that Tib says was put in the water despite showing obvious signs of the creatures. They knew the threat of zebra mussels, which is why just weeks before they were discovered here in Waco, Parks and Wildlife actually trained city staff on how to spot them, and that's how they were found. A lone pair of eyes saw the mussels in the water and that kicked off this whole experiment. We defined an area and um, the decision was made to put tarps all over the bottom of the, of the lake here to smother out the zebra mussels. Uh, they require oxygen to live, they require food to be taken from the water, and so if they were smashed to the bottom of the lake, they're not going to be able to do any of that. The mussels were found right at the shoreline. An area of the lake about the size of a football field was covered in tarps held down by sandbags. It was a Waco City employee's idea. We gave it kind of out of a 10% chance of success, but it was the city's money, so we helped. <laughs> and uh, he was right. It worked. Six months later, they pulled up the tarps and found one zebra mussel. And now years later, they've yet to find any more. How do they describe the success? Lucky. <laughs> that would be one word I would use. Here's why. The mussels at Lake Waco were caught early. There were only about 75 of them at the time, all adults, and they hadn't reproduced yet. It was caught just in the nick of time for that technique to work. Most often, by the time the mussels are discovered, there are far too many to control. 
That's the case in both Canyon and Medina Lakes. Chemical removal of the mussels would have a negative effect on the environment, potentially killing off other wildlife. Not to mention... It's going to be hugely expensive, a lake of this size, uh, to put chemicals in there. Um, it, so not only is it environmentally damaging, um, it'll be very expensive. So on lakes like Canyon and Medina, it's about learning to live with them. Mother Nature helps out somewhat on Medina Lake, where the water level is low, down 57 feet. In areas where the water dries up, the mussels will die. The lake level going up and down like that certainly could uh, aid in slowing the population and maybe they won't reach in a variable level lake, they may not reach the just massively high infestation levels that we see on lakes like Travis and Canyon. At Canyon Lake, changes had to be made to deal with the infestation. Canyon Lake Water Service Company enlarged its infrastructure, making it big enough for divers to do inspections and remove any mussels they find. And now we actually have a brush that goes down into the casing and will clean out all of the debris or any kind of zebra mussels and push them out back into the lake. So you got one of those bottle cleaners. Huh? It is a giant <laughs> bottle cleaner on a drill and it just goes all the way down. Canyon Lake Water also changed up the screens on the water intakes, moving to copper, a material the zebra mussels don't like to stick to. But the biggest solution... Clean, drain, and dry. Clean, drain, dry. Clean, drain, and dry their boats. Must come from boaters. The important thing is that when you come out of a lake, you know, check your boat over. Particularly if it's in a, a, a slip and it's been in there a long time, you really need to clean it. Drain all the water from every compartment, raise and lower the motor, get all the water out of that. And then when you get home, open everything up and let everything dry out, preferably for a week. That's for lakes in general. When you know that it's a zebra mussel infect infested lake like this one, that makes it even much more important to make sure that uh, there's no water on board. That way these critters can't stay on board either. A new case that explains episode airs every Monday during our news at six. Tomorrow, the topic is oil and why drilling for some in Texas is not the solution to bring down high gas prices. You can watch any episode of case that explains on demand. Just scan the QR code and take it to ksat.com slash explains. Another look outside with a live cam that temperature is coming down ever so slowly, but we're still in the 80s. Some spots across South Central Texas still in the 90s at this hour. So the heat wave is on and South Central Texas is one of the hottest spots across the country today. In fact, we were tied with Phoenix for the hottest spot on this map, 98 El Paso. We've got 70s on the West Coast, 80 in OKC, 70s up near the Great Lakes. So it really started to feel a lot like summer this weekend. But in fact, we're still 16 days away from the official start of summer, the summer solstice. That is not until June 21st, so we're getting a jump on things this year. We'll talk more about what this week has in store. I'll get you an update on what's going on in the tropics coming up here in just a little bit. Tim. Thanks, Katie. Coming up next, she was one of the first victims we learned about in the Uvalde school massacre, and now a friend wants you to know about the kind of teacher she was as the Uvalde com community continues to mourn. And it is the final day of the Queen's Platinum Jubilee, her message to the world as she hits this major milestone. She is described as a dedicated teacher who spent any free moment with her husband and daughter, loved her dog Kane, and pushed her limit every day at CrossFit. Her name is Ava Morellis, and she's one of the 21 victims killed in the Uvalde school massacre. As her family waits to lay her to rest, a friend is speaking about the beloved teacher and a person he called her friend. Our Alicia Barrera spoke with the DPS trooper who actually responded to the shooting scene about what he, know, what he wants people to know about Ava. It was an honor to spend the last moment with Ava as she left this earth into a greater place. Juan Maldonado, a DPS trooper, never imagined a call for a shooting on Tuesday, May 24th, would put his hometown of Uvalde and the nation in a state of mourning. It's a tragic situation, but I can tell you that Uvalde will pull together. He met Eva Mireles and her husband, Ruben, years ago when their daughters joined the same select soccer team. They're both devastated losing uh, their mom, you know, as I would call their second mom and Addie's real mom. 
Eva loved her life and those in it. She walks into that room and we knew we were going to have fun because Eva would be the fun person. She would light up, she would light up the whole room just because of her smile, her personality, and she's going to speak her mind. Maldonado says a hero like her will never be replaced. Eva's a fighter and she did everything she could to protect her babies and that's her students. So. We know she did everything she could, and she protected him to her last breath. Alicia Barrera, KSAT 12 News. Eva's visitation is scheduled for this coming Thursday at Rushing Estes Knowles Mortuary. And then the following day will be a funeral mass at 10 a.m. at Sacred Heart Catholic Church with internment at Hillcrest Settlement Cemetery. A triumphant celebration in London for the 2022 Jubilee. We'll take you there for a recap of today's finale. To London now, where the Jubilee party is ending on a good note with a surprise appearance by Great Britain's beloved Queen Elizabeth. She appeared with other royals on the balcony of Buckingham Palace, delighting the crowds below and television viewers around the world. The Queen was not able to attend most of the events after experiencing some discomfort on the first day. Tonight's appearance was the grand finale to celebrate her remarkable 70-year reign. She waved at the deafening crowd to show her appreciation. Residents say it was a moment they won't forget. It's one thing that the British do the best, pomp and pageantry. We've got the best queen in the world, haven't we? Best country in the world. More than 10,000 people were in attendance tonight alone, including sports legends, actors, and famous singers like Ed Sheeran. Doesn't look like it's 100 degrees there. No, no I don't <laughs> think so. I think it, maybe it wasn't what happened today, but the night before, I saw people sitting watching the concert with blankets on their lap. Yeah. Wouldn't that be nice? It Boo. would be nice. I'm <laughs> jealous. <laughs> I know. Meanwhile, we're cooking here in the oven. Yeah, yeah, a little bit different here. I want to start off with, I mean, because you know it's going to be hot. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But I want to get you an update on what's going on in the tropics. What is now Tropical Storm Alex heading toward Bermuda dumped a lot of rain across South Florida, especially around Miami. Uh, early Saturday morning, late Friday night, early Saturday morning. Some spots there got more than 10 inches of rain. And then when the system, so when it was dumping all that rain across, across Florida, it wasn't a tropical storm yet. It was still fairly disorganized. But once it got east of Florida and into the warm waters of the Atlantic, it was able to organize a bit more. And then it got its name. So this is Tropical Storm Alex. It is heading toward Bermuda, and it could affect that island uh, during the day tomorrow as it maintains its tropical storm status for now as it continues to drift northeast into the open Atlantic over the next couple of days it is expected to fizzle out aside from tropical storm Alex no new tropical development is expected over the next two to five days so we're not to the official start of summer just yet but hurricane season did begin on June 1st so it's underway and I'll step off screen here quickly so you can just get a look at the names for this uh, hurricane season I know folks like to check and see if their name uh, made the list this year uh, perhaps so uh, you're on the list for 2022. Uh, we've got an article all about what to expect from this hurricane season. It's up right now on KSAT.com. Also, don't forget, we've got the Hur KSAT Hurricane Tracker app in addition to the Weather Authority app. That's a free download for Apple and Android as well. Speaking of tropical systems, rainfall, our rainfall outlook over the next week is not good at all. You can almost see the outline of where that heat high or ridge of high pressure is going to be over Texas. But I want to zoom out a little bit more and get a look elsewhere across the country. A lot of rain is expected across parts of northeast Oklahoma, uh, southeast Kansas, Missouri, Arkansas, and then into parts of Kentucky and Tennessee. And if you were with us last half hour, we talked a little bit about the influence of La Nina over North America when it comes to temperatures, but also when it comes to precipitation. And so as I change this over to that La Nina graphic, I want you to kind of keep in mind where this swath of a lot of rain, several inches of rain is anticipated over the next week. And that is 
where the jet stream is going to be present and then points north of that. So even looking at the rainfall outlook across the country for this week, we can see La Nina's influence keeping all the rain making energy, the uh, areas of low pressure off to our north, leaving us stuck with the heat high, dry and hot over the next week and hot kind of an understatement here. Our temperatures will be trending about 10 degrees above average each afternoon, not only through the end of this work week, but even into next weekend. So it it is hot, y'all. Just a few heat safety reminders. We're going to toss these your way every now and then. Uh, again, like I've, I always say this, we're Texans. We're tough. We're used to the heat, but it never hurts to get a few reminders here and there. Of course, one of the most important ones, beat the heat. Remember to check that back seat. Stay hydrated, especially if you're going to be spending a lot of time outdoors. And remember your furry friends as well. If it's hot for us, it's hot for them. And also watch those paws on that very hot pavement and asphalt. Keep in mind that those pavement and asphalt numbers are uh, much, much higher than the actual air temperature. So take care of those furry friends. A look at your Monday. Some morning clouds will be around warm and muggy starting off mid 70s. It is going to be pretty gross out there in the morning by lunchtime. 92 shaking a bit of the cloud cover and then abundant sunshine tomorrow afternoon for a high around 102. We had a good breeze in place today. Tomorrow, I think it could feel a little bit windy at times with some gusts up to about 30 miles per hour, but our sustained wind speeds will generally be between about 10 and 20 miles per hour, especially after lunchtime. So during the hottest part of the day, we will have a nice wind in place and that will provide just a little bit of relief, not only tomorrow, but also Tuesday and Wednesday as well. After that, not as much of a breeze back half of the week and into next weekend, but the heat, it hangs tough. Tim Court. If you need me, I'll be by the pool this week. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Movies that open huge usually see their ticket sales fall back to earth by at least 50% in the second weekend, but uh, that's not the case for Top Gun Maverick. They're still flying high. The new record they set next. I thought maybe this one. It makes you look like King Zog of Albania. Downton Abbey, a new era, picked up $3 million, falling to fifth place. The bad guys are still zooming along. $3.3 million put the animated adventure in fourth place. The Bob's Burgers movie stayed in third, taking in $4.5 million. Things just got out of hand. $9.3 million kept Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness in second place. We're going into combat on a level no living pilot's ever seen. With no new challengers, Top Gun Maverick fell just 32% in its sophomore weekend, grossing $86 million for a 10-day domestic total of $292 million, already Tom Cruise's highest grossing film ever at the domestic box office. In Hollywood, I'm David Daniel. Our San Antonio missions have to postpone two games due to COVID-19. And also, what almost sidelined Rafael Nadal before he was able to win the French Open? Let's find out by heading over to Greg Simmons for more on what's an instant replay. He did something I would never do before playing an important match is just numb yourself. That's just crazy. And San Antonio FC drops only their second road game of the season. Coming up tonight on a brand new edition of Instant Replay. Our San Antonio missions were forced to postpone back-to-back -back games this weekend due to minor league baseball's health and safety protocols before having to hit the road to Corpus Christi. And why did Rafael Nadal have to take an injection before he's able to compete and win the French Open? He will tell us. Lopez keeps it short to Keko. Keko sends it in, and it's in the back of the net. San Antonio SC dropped only their second road game of the season in Sacramento this weekend. Where does that lead them in the USL standings? And what do you think of Canelo Alvarez agreeing to the trilogy with Triple G rather than a rematch? First with Dimitri Bivol. The sports guys tackle that and more tonight. All that plus hot ice from game two of the NBA Finals. You saw right here on KSAT 12. Instant Replay is live and it is next. We've got a series there now. We sure do. All right. Thank you, Greg. We'll be right back. That's it. We're all done for all of us here. Thanks for watching. Be sure to tune into Good Morning San Antonio for all your latest overnight news. And all new Instant Replay starts right now. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to a brand new edition of Instant Replay. The O'Connor Panthers are state champs. So are the DeHannis Cowgirls. The Reagan Rattlers are headed to the state baseball tournament. So are the DeHannis Cowboys. And the Boston Celtics were looking to stun the Golden State Warriors again on game day.
Boston Celtics shocked a lot of people with their four-quarter dominance of the Warriors in Game 1. Part of Boston's success was the play of former Spur Derek White, who came off the Celtics bench for 32 minutes, scored 21 points on 6 of 11 shooting, including five three-pointers. Could the Celtics steal another road game, or would the Warriors split the series before it shifts to the East Coast? Let's find out together. First quarter, Celtics start how they left game one. Jalen Brown with a basket and the foul. Three-point play. Right away, the Celtics are up eight points with a 13-5 lead. Moments later, Brown again, spotting up for the three and a nine-point Celtics lead. Brown had 13 in the first quarter. But Boston had seven first-quarter turnovers that kept the Warriors in it. Steph Curry with a three ball right before the end of the quarter. Curry with a shot off the glass of the lead. Golden State is up 31-30 after one. Second quarter now. Cue up former Spur Derek White. First, the pull-up jumper from 15 feet. Next time down the floor, White all alone in the corner. He's going to shoot another three. The Celtics are up 40 to 35. Later in the quarter, Draymond Green wide open for a three. Then Jason Tatum with two of his game-high 21 first-half points. The Warriors' Andrew Wiggins scored seven points in the last five minutes of the quarter, including the final basket. And the Warriors, by the way, lead at halftime 52-50. Third quarter, Draymond Green to Clay Thompson for the three. Warriors go up 59-52, their largest lead of the game. Then it's Thompson again for the layup. The Warriors are up 10 with eight minutes left in the third. Late in the quarter, Curry starts firing from deep, and it's a 14-point lead. Next time down the floor from 30 feet away, another tray. Now it's time for Jordan Poole. He fires a deep three that would make it a 20-point Warrior lead as the seconds tick down. Poole from half court, and it is good. Golden State outscored Boston. 35-14 in the third quarter. The Warriors lead 87-64 to three. Four quarter now. Poole adds on. The pull-up jumper makes a 91-64, a 27-point Golden State lead. Thompson adds to his night with this shot and a 29-point Golden State lead. Curry had a game-high 29. Jason Tatum had 28 for Boston. Derek White added 12 off the bench. Warriors outshoot Boston 45 to 38 percent. Here is your final score. Wasn't even close down the stretch. 107 to 88. The series is now tied at one all. The Warriors rely on Draymond Green's defensive intensity to blow up this game wide open. We knew our backs were against the wall. Uh, we couldn't go into Boston being down 2-0, so he lit the fire under us. And as this whole season, uh, he lit it and everybody else follows. That's the name of the game in the finals. You know, um, it's, uh, it's hard to get an open shot out there, and it's, it's supposed to be difficult. Uh, game one was was too easy for Boston um, with the looks they were getting in that fourth quarter. They did all the stuff that we talked about, um, stuff that we knew they were going to do going in, and um, we just got to be ready to go from from that second half on. You know, we're going to do what we do, focus on us, and um, we just didn't get it done tonight. We'll be better at home game three. Remember now, in that game one, Al Horford right there, for example, had 26 points, and Derek White had 21. They did not have that good of a game tonight by comparison. So games three and four will be in Boston on Wednesday and Friday, live here on KSAT 12. We now know there will be a game five, Monday, June the 13th, 8 p.m. in San Francisco. For the first time since 2018, the Reagan Rattlers are heading to the UIL State Baseball Tournament up in Round Rock after splitting the first two games of the regional final series. The Rattlers punched their ticket to Dell Diamond with a 6-2 victory over Lake Travis in the decisive third game of the regional final. Throughout this season, Reagan has had a slogan, Fight 98, which stands for the 98 miles it takes to travel to Round Rock from San Antonio. Reagan was thought to be one of the best teams in the state in 2020, but the playoffs were canceled due to the COVID-19 pandemic, and they reached out to the seniors and juniors from that squad throughout this season. We made a group chat with all the guys that year and uh, uh, they, they, were, they were talking to us and we were doing it for them and uh, we're doing it for the guy, guys around us and uh, Fight 98. Insane. Uh, it, it doesn't really it doesn't really kick in until we step foot there. It's kind of I'm still in awe right now, but it's amazing. All right, Reagan faces Rockwall Heath in the state semifinals this Friday at 7. Congratulations to the O'Connor softball team who made history last night in the OIL Class 6A state title game. The Panthers capped an unbelievable seventh inning rally with a walk-off walk to stun Lake Ridge 7-6 and claim the program's first state championship. Senior Jada Munoz was named the tournament MVP after hitting two homers, including a game-tying solo home run to lead off the bottom of the seventh. I'm just so proud of this whole team. I, I knew we couldn't give up, and I had faith in every single one of us. And when Jada hit that home run, I just knew this was our game. I told Coach B the second I was up to bat, I'm like, we're not going to extra innings. We're going to win this. I've grown up with almost all of these girls, <laughs> and I think just 
winning this is just the best reward we can ever earn. Being behind the first inning and just knowing that we could come back and hit the ball as well, it's just it was so important to us to just not give up and just keep fighting. There was never a doubt. I mean, these girls have worked day in and day out, and Jada and Sammy came through, so have all the other girls, and the excitement is running through the roof right now, and I'm just proud as an understatement. That's all I can say. O'Connor finishes her season with a 32-1 overall record. And for the first time since 2019, the DeHannis Cowgirls are UIL state softball champions. After losing to Dodge City in last year's state title game, the Cowgirls exacted a measure of revenge on Tuesday by defeating the Hornets this year in the Class 1A state semifinals 2-0 behind a stellar performance by senior pitcher Marissa Santos. Then on Wednesday, DeHannis broke out the bats to take down Hermley 6-2 in the title game. Mabry Herman was named tournament MVP after posting three hits in the championship game. These girls are like my sisters, friends, buddies. I love playing with them, practicing with them. The whole state tournament is like a big sleepover. It's so much fun. So getting to this point is a lot of hard work, but really, really rewarding and really fun. We had business to finish and we were going to do it no matter what. And that helped us a lot to, that we needed that extra push. And if we would have won my freshman year last year, then we would have come in here with huge heads. Like we, we knew what it was going to be like to lose. So we don't ever want to feel that again, so we didn't. All right, DeHannis outscored their opponents 84-3 to over the course of seven games on the run to the title. Now the Cowboys will look to bring home their own state title. The DeHannis baseball team swept Fayetteville in the UIL Class 1A Regional Final and will face Abbott in the state semifinals this Wednesday at noon at Dell Diamond in Round Rock. Time now for tonight's instant replay poll question. Do you believe the feud between Texas A&M and head coach Jimbo Fisher and Alabama head coach Nick Saban is really over? Vote now. We'll have the results at the end of the broadcast tonight. There is a lot to talk about in this edition of Instant Replay up next. Your winner by majority decision and new WBC, WBA, IBO Ring Magazine middleweight champion of the world. The third fight between Canelo and Triple G is finally happening, but does anyone want to see this after Canelo just lost? And the Spurs anniversary logos have not been accepted well by some Spurs fans. The sports guys share their thoughts. SAFC is preparing to wrap up their three-game road trip. Their rematch against Colorado has now been set. Could this former mission end up Rookie of the Year? And Rafael Nadal revealed that he could not even feel his left foot while he won the French Open today. We got all that, plus our Scholar Athlete of the Week, and the Scripps National Spelling Bee Champion comes right from San Antonio when Instant Replay continues live next.